From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Cube. This is Dave Vellante, and we're here to talk about a very important talk topic around de-risking infrastructure with business continuity. This is critical, especially in the era of COVID. And with me to really explore this issue is Dr. Rico. He's the Vice President, Office of the CTO at Infinidad. Doc, good to see you. Good to see you again, Dave. And Ken Steinhardt is also here. He's a field CTO uh, at Infinidad. And I, and I got to tell the audience, so Doc, you're also the chairman of the Mass Motorcycles Association. You, you're a very cool guy. You got, you're a pilot. You're a firearms instructor, all about safety. And, and Ken and Doc, you're both musicians, right? Doc, I think you play the drums. And Ken, I know when we first met, you know, you, you're, a, you're a music guy. So, wow, you know, surrounded by talent. So thank you so much for coming on. Glad to be here. Great to see you. Well, the other thing, too, is that you guys are, you know, longtime storage industry experts. Uh, I've known you both for many, many years. Infinidat, deep engineering expertise. Uh, of course, everybody knows about Moshe, created the most successful product in the history of the storage industry. And we're going to talk about the importance of data, especially in this era of COVID and how mission criticality has really become more and more important. So I want to start, Doc, with you and, and this notion of business continuity. How are you thinking about, and Infinidat thinking about business continuity in this isolation era? Well, it's, that's a really great question, Dave, because it has changed quite a bit. And as you said, we've known each other a long time, uh, all the way back to when I still had hair. That was uh, how long ago it was. Uh, but, you know, business continuity is something that every business constantly looks at throughout their evolution. And it's one of these things where certain applications are typically more mission critical than others. And lately, what we've seen is this genre of, a, of the lights out data center has become absolutely critical to operating a business today. People can't just be on site anymore. People need to be working remotely, and that includes data center personnel in, in many respects. So this whole concept of business continuity now encompasses not only the operation of the equipment that's on premises or sometimes even off premises, but it also encompasses applications that people need access to that they may not have thought of, thought of as mission critical before because working from home was a convenience or working remotely was a convenience, not a requirement for their business. You know, Ken, I know you talked to a lot of CIOs. I was sitting in a CIO roundtable with my friends down at ETR recently, and one of the CIOs said, you know, when, when COVID hit, we realized that our, our business, quote unquote, business continuity plans were just way too narrowly focused on, on DR. What are you seeing from the IT community? Yeah, it's funny because I, I literally was on a CIO roundtable uh, with the West Coast this morning, and uh, there were a couple of interesting comments that really stuck out to me from some of the people there. One was commenting of just uh, reaffirming what Doc said, how much people are working from home now. They said traditionally they had had traditional offices and they've just recently hired in this company about 250 people. He said all of them are going to be remote workers and they're normal from here on out for the next 150 that they're looking to hire is just that business as usual will be remote work. And one of the other CIOs chimed in with a, a quote that really stuck out to me. He said remote work requires always on infrastructure in this day and age. And it's just a whole new way of having to make sure that businesses are operational and their workers can do what they're supposed to do. Well, so let's stay on that. I mean, you know, ransomware is on everybody's mind. I mean, all you have to do is look at the stock market. You see what's, what's happened with Zoom. It's exploded. All the endpoint securities, identi identity access management security companies are, are going crazy because you know, people are now so vulnerable. So they're more exposed to ransomware, uh, Ken. What do we really need to know about ransomware? First, uh, the smart company or smart organization is the one that is prepared and assumes the worst, which means don't think it can't happen to you, especially when you look at a couple of the more public examples in the last couple of years in particular. So it means you must take steps to protect yourself, particularly for the sake of 
your, your company, your business, your employees, your shareholders, your customers, everyone else. And that means deploying technology that assumes that if the worst case scenario could happen to you, how do you make sure that you have taken the steps that you can avoid the worst possible scenarios that could happen? Well, you know, Doc, a lot of times when you have this discussion on ransomware, people say, well, should I pay the ransom? And sometimes people say, well, yeah, maybe you should. But you hope you never get there, right? I mean, no, well, you absolutely hope you never get there. I mean, yeah. And there's just horrible uh, examples of paying ransom that just don't work. I mean, just look at uh, the Somalia pirates as an example, right? It's, it doesn't stop them at all. Um, but, you know, take, take a look at what the potential impact is, not the potential, just the potential impact to your business and your employees, but the potential impact to society. You know, a couple of years ago, Sony was, was a very notorious case. More recently, a couple of months ago, Garmin. Um, you know, as you mentioned, I'm a pilot. <laughs> I was very worried, as, as were a lot of people in, in, the, in, the, you know, in, in the aircraft and in aviation industry. What's going to happen, not only with our private information, and account information, but what's going to happen with avionics updates? You know, if, if Garmin you know, didn't have a fallback plan and a way to recover, you know, then what was going to happen? And I'm sure they were going through the, through the process and the thoughts of, of, you know, should we pay this? Should, how, do, how else do we get out of this? But fortunately, they had a very good plan in place, and it only took them a couple of days to, to restore back to normal operations. You know, arguably, as far as avionics goes, they, they were lucky in the sense that this happened to them right in the middle of, a, of an update cycle, which is a 28 day cycle. But the fact that it only took them a couple of days, you know, uh, congratulations to them. I'm sure that with, uh, with even better plans and, and a little bit of extra effort, it could have been a matter of hours instead of days. Well, let's come back to business continuity. Ken, do you, do you feel as though businesses are, are not prepared based on you know, the, the conversation we were having earlier? Um, some are, some aren't. Uh, we'll be getting into that, and I think in a little bit uh, more detail as well. But um, historically, organizations I think have focused far too much just on traditional disaster recovery, usually with things like some of the technologies of uh, that have been around a long while, like backup, and all too often haven't focused towards the technologies that really do keep the business running uh, without human intervention if something were to ever go wrong. So, Doug, anything you add to that? I mean, what's the state of, of business continuity from your, your perspective? Are, are people having to really starting to accelerate a journey because of this COVID? I absolutely think they're accelerating a journey. They're also looking now at, you know, this, this concept of multiple active sites. Um, you know, the, the, the concept of active sites is, is not something new. It's something that dates back a couple of decades uh, in, a, in a lot of the financial industry. You know, when, when they were struck, they were looking at some very significant uh, changes in their operational paradigms because they realized that the systems going down is only a small percentage of the problem. The people impact is far worse. The operational procedures, the human, human intervention. So what they would do is typically build out multiple sites and rotate the applications between them. What they really haven't done yet, at least not on a, on a broad scale, and, and certainly not in the U.S., in some cases in, in Europe, uh, they've, they've, they've started this journey of having the applications running simultaneously in multiple sites, accessing the same data sets. And this is something, it's, it's not a brand new concept, but it's something that has improved significantly. The technologies have improved significantly over the course of the past decade. And you know, with, with the, inter, uh, the introduction of our active active solution a couple of years ago, even brought it to an entirely new level. The people right. aspect that Doc mentioned is, is so critical. And that's certainly been one of the key lessons learned when real disasters have occurred, is that the systems have to be, if you really wanna keep your business operating, making an assumption that people are going to have, depending upon the nature of the disaster, very different priorities. And one of them is not, gee, do I keep these IT systems running or not? They're gonna be worried about their coworkers, their families, other things, et cetera. So the ultimate has to be systems that are capable of continuing the operation of the business in the face of 
a site failure, a metropolitan area failure, or whatever it takes without the requirement necessarily for human intervention. So, and I want to get into active, active, but before I do, I wonder if we could do a little sort of data protection 101, you know, you have backup, you have replication, you got snapshots. Doc, what do we need to know about each in the context of this discussion? I think the, the important thing uh, to look at when you think about the different types of technologies that you can apply to solutions is that some of them apply to specific equipment failures and some of them apply to data failure. And I separate equipment from data in the sense that data can be corrupted in some shape or form. It can be through malicious attack, which like ransomware as an example, uh, only one example, other types of malware can, can play a factor as well. Or it can be uh, incidental, uh, you know, somebody pressing a wrong button, it can be uh, an, an operational procedure, or perhaps a, another system failure that causes a change in the data or a corruption in the data that makes it essentially unusable. So whenever we're looking at this, we have to start with what is the recovery point objective, the RPO, that's where what most people start with. You know, and, and the RPO, in, in essence, if, if you think of, you know, time zero right now, it's, it's where the failure occurs. Work backwards. Um, how far back can I go uh, and still, still sustain my business? Now, there may be other procedural things you can do to catch up as close to that RPO of zero as you can. But each of these technologies that we're talking about give you a different RPO, it's like rewinding a tape back to a point in time. So that's that's the first place to start. Okay, so let's let's bring up that slide. Actually, this is I, I actually like this. This is the fireball slide I call it. But but in it, this is how people measure sort of the 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 business impact, if you will, RPO and, and RTO. And and what I like about this is is in this digital world, you know, it's kind of a cliche, but everything's getting more intense. People want they don't want to lose. Data. When you ask you know, a customer, how much data are you willing to lose? They say none. none. And you say, well, how much are you willing to pay? So, Ken, I wonder if you could sort of describe that, that tension and that dynamic that's really yeah. underscored in this slide. Oh, yeah. You hit it on the head, Dave. It's the traditional trade-off between RPO, RTO, and cost. As Doc described with RPO, the objective would be to get as close to zero data loss as you could possibly get. With RTO, which measures the time associated with how long will it take you to get back to your acceptable level of RPO, that is a time factor where for every minute or second that goes by that you're not in business, that's the extension of the RTO. And historically, the closer you get as you approach zero RPO and zero RTO, usually the greater the cost goes up. And it's always been the eternal trade-off. Is a great analogy. It's sort of like if you went to buy a car. RPO equates to the quality of the solution. RTO is time or speed and cost is cost. If you buy a car, if it's good and it's fast, it won't be cheap. If it's good and it's cheap, it won't be fast. And if it's fast and it's cheap, it won't be good. So usually that's, that's the kind of trade-off we all have to deal with there. And um, the factors that will impact that, uh, as Doc alluded to, can be many. It's, uh, there's a, many aspects that you have to consider in terms of what is the service level that the business requires, and do we have solutions in place that can actually give us what is the real service level that the business requires if something were to go bad? Because customers have gone through you know, unnatural acts. I mean, Doc, you, before you were kind of describing what some people would refer to as the sort of three site data centers and all, all kinds of things that people will do. But, but that brings us to active, active. Doc, Doc what, what is active, active? Yeah, let, let me interject a, a, a point there and then I'll, I'll get to your question about active, active. You know, first is the, the question that Ken raised about service level, that's mm -hmm. absolutely critical. And a business may have different service levels for different applications. Right. And you never really know what that is. For example, I, I was working with a, a university in, in a, you know, a few years back and you know, you normally think, well, universities, what are they worried about? You know, they're worried about their grading systems. Everybody's always worried about their financial systems. This particular university was worried about their golf course reservation system. 
And, you know, the, their number one mission critical application, and I'm sure there was a little chunk tongue in cheek there as well, was, was the golf course reservation system because that directly impacted their alumni and had a direct correlation to the incoming donations, you know, for the following year. So you never know what's going to be mission critical. <laughs> Closer to home, uh, working very recently, there's, there's a great case study from Altman Hospital on our, on our website. One of the things that they, they did, which I thought was absolutely astounding, was they uh, took advantage of uh, our offer to, uh, to loan them um, free storage for a while, um, leveraging some of the COD that they, in, you know, capacity on demand that they weren't using. One of the reasons that they wanted this extra capacity was so that they can make telepresence available to their patients to visit with their families. You know, at a time when families can't go into the hospital to visit, you know, when, when people are, are, are ill, you know, what a great comfort to their families. So this is, this is a, a, a great way to look at it. When you, when you think about these different service levels now, and you think about the different types of replication technologies that are available, you know, you look at the multi-site. What is multi-site really doing for you? Multi-site is giving you some level of synchronous replication so that you have an RPO of zero, recovery point objective. It still may not be an RTO of zero, but it'll be darn close to it. But more importantly, it's giving you an additional site uh, to really maintain that RPO of zero in case the disaster radius, the, the blast area, the the impact zone is even further away. Now, this isn't going to uh, prevent any type of malicious intent. It's not going to prevent the ransomware case and things like that, but it'll certainly prevent the, uh, you know, the catastrophic failure of the data center. What does Active Active do? Well, Active Active now gives you the read-write capability, and our, our multi-site implication uh, implementation, by the way, leverages our Active Active. So it gives you the ability now to have a simultaneously running instance of an application in multiple data centers, reading and writing from the da same data set. Uh, and, and what that gives you is not only an RPO of zero, but an RTO of zero, uh, because now you can have uh, an application in another data center stand in and take over for it. Naturally, the application needs to be able to do that. There are a lot of applications that are capable of it. You know, the, the Oracle Parallel Service Server or Rack technology, uh, you know, gives you that capability. There are other types of clustering technologies that will fail over almost instant, instantaneously that will give you that capability. So that's what, where the active active comes into play. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, when I started in the industry, it was about the, the, the VAX clusters were sort of the now thing, right? I mean, yep. so that, that <clears> kind of started babies. it all. <laughs> right. So... Well, well, Ken, you know, what are you seeing in, in the marketplace? Are you seeing, you know, what, what's the adoption look like? Are there any differences that you see by region or what, what can you tell us there? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, some of the first organizations that obviously jumped onto active, active type solutions were those where there were uh, in particularly in things like financial services and compliance requirements or financial incentives or motivation to make sure that uh, the business was always operational. And it's interesting because there was a study that was done back uh, all the way back in 2003 by Roper that asked business executives and IT executives the same questions relative to their perceptions of their companies or organizations ability to meet RPO or RTO service level agreements. Right. And we have some data on this that I want to I want to bring up. So this is this is the RPO data, but please carry on. Exactly. And so they asked questions that really were about RPO or RTO. You know, hey, if a disaster hit, would you lose data and how much? And what the data showed was that the business executives and IT executives in Europe were actually pretty much on the same page. They both said, yeah, we probably would lose some data or a reasonable amount associated with it. But was a little fright what was a little frightening was there appeared to be a chasm of disconnect between the business executives and the IT executives in the US. And what it showed was that the IT executives were on the same page as the European IT executives and the business executives from Europe saying that, yeah, we'd probably lose some data. But it showed that very few of the business executives thought that they would. 
And then similarly, when they were asked the question about RTO, how long would it take, you know, in terms of days, hours, et cetera, for your full operation to be back in operation? And granted, they were talking in 2003 terms back then, uh, which was a little longer than where the technology can now address it now. There was again, this consistency between the IT executives in both continents and countries, uh, as well as the European business executives, but again, a disconnect where the business executives in the US thought, oh no, we'll be fine. We'll have everything back in a couple of days or less and it won't be an issue. Uh, in my opinion, in looking at that data when it first came out, my impression was, wow, now I understand why a lot of business continuity projects don't get approved because the IT people know that they need it, but the business executives have, if I could be so bold, an unrealistically optimistic view of their ability to achieve RPO and RTO. Uh, I'll give you a great example. There was a, a major high-tech company back in the, uh, around that time frame that actually had a major outage in their email system. And email was not perceived to be at the time a ultra mission critical application for them. Uh, I know it seems strange in this day and age, but back then it was considered sort of an afterthought. And they had a four hour SLA in case something went down where, hey, if we're down for four hours, if we get it back in four hours, we're fine. And so IT thought they were doing a great job because they got it back in less than four. It was about three point something. And it turned out that the real impact of the business was so overwhelming, they had to completely overhaul the IT infrastructure that they'd put in place to deliver that. So it's, it's an interesting issue. And it's the kind of thing where, as a result, I believe that as we sit here today in 2020, the disconnect in the US still exists. If you look across Europe, you tend to find a lot of deployments of active active. The first country that probably did a ton of it was Germany. And then a lot of the other European countries did as well for a multitude of reasons. You tend to see a lot of active active deployments in Europe, but you don't see anywhere near as many as if I could be so bold, we probably should be seeing in the US. And I believe a major contributing factor to that is that there is still this disconnect between business executives having a false sense of security that is unfounded by the infrastructures that they have in place. And if they were to ask their IT people, and maybe that's a good idea for them to talk a little more, they'd probably find that they're more exposed than they ever realized. Right, and of course in Europe, you've got a you know, much tighter prox proximity and you're up against borders of a 200 mile or 200 kilometer rule that we, we've, uh, governments have tried to impose here uh, really aren't can't be imposed in a lot of cases. Um, okay, let's get into what you guys are doing here in this space. So, so Doc, how do you approach ensuring access to mission critical data? What's Infinidet's angle? Yeah, I think it's you know several different layers that need to be applied here. The first Infinidet's angle starts with the fact that our storage is 100% data availability guaranteed. So, simple enough. I mean, they, it, it's triple redundant architecture, you know, seven nines reliability design, which equates to, you know, 3.16 seconds per year of, of, uh, of downtime, which is less than a, a SCSI time. <laughs> you know, let, let's start with just, right, for, forget the nonsense. The system's 100% available, available, guaranteed. Uh, you know, we, we put some teeth behind that, and that's a, that's a great way to start. It, it's not necessarily going to fundamentally protect your data from site outages and network outages and server outages and things like that. So let's let's beef that up and, and go to inactive active infrastructure. And now you can take uh, take the system and put it either elsewhere behind a firewall on the same data center floor or in a metropolitan area, um, it, where, wherever you need it to be, separate power zones, separate network zones, uh, make it even more available. And then if you really want to go that next level of protection because you're worried about regional outages and things of that nature, multi-site replication. But now let's up the ante even further. Let's look at the, uh, the, the malicious intent. Let's look at the data corruption. Let's look at all of the other possibilities of things that can happen to your data. So implement snapshotting technology. And the snapshot technology in InfiniBox is uh, essentially free. There's no cost for the software. There's no performance impact because it's part of metadata updates that are happening all the time anyway. So there's, there's zero additional overhead to that. 
There's no additional, there's no copying of data going on with a snapshot. So there's no uh, additional cost penalty associated with it. And you can snapshot this frequently for, uh, snapshot any of your, your data frequently to protect against data corruption. And if you're worried about some sort of malicious uh, aspect that's going to engage and perhaps gain access to the snapshots, we have a mutable technology and that is also free. It's there, it's, it, it doesn't cost you anything other than the time it takes an administrator to determine what the policy is. And now that cannot be modified, it can, can't be deleted, can't be modified, it can't be updated, can't be written to, uh, you know, inside whatever the, pol the defined policy is. So now you're protected, you know, hundred percent availability, increase that hundred percent availability with active active, increase your, your RPO capability with distance and protect yourself against data corruption with immutable snapshots. Uh, well, or some combination of standard snapshots and immutable snapshots. Yeah, so I was, I was gonna ask Ken if, if this is a cost effective approach, but I mean, it's, it's free, it comes in the stack. That, uh, I mean, I, uh, that is the key word and you both just said it. Uh, standard and included functionality, all based on that great snapshot technology, which was the foundation for it that Doc described. Active, active, standard and included, the ability to go to a third site for disaster recovery at the industry's lowest asynchronous RPO with a remote site, standard and included, immutable snaps, standard and included. Uh, so compared to traditional views of what most people have had, back to our illustrious triangle earlier of RPO versus RTO versus cost, you're still going to have the additional cost of media at a remote site for protecting your data, obviously, but in terms of software and license costs, we're making it simpler, we're making it easier, we're making it standard and included, and we're just making it so much more readily available for organizations to be able to achieve superior RTO and RPO at a cost point that maybe certainly is a little bit higher than just having that single system that Doc alluded to that's still 100% available, but it's way below what the expectations of this industry have been over the last 20 years. Yeah, which is double, triple, I mean, easily. Um, well, Ken, let me stay on you for a second. You've worked with a, for a lot of different storage companies, Doc, you have as well, but, yeah. but how, how different is this? How unique is this? There are surprisingly few vendors that can offer true zero RPO at true zero RTO. There's really only a handful, we're one of them. Uh, and by handful, I mean about three in the industry, including ourselves. And where I think we differentiate is fundamentally to a lot of those points we just mentioned. The software is standard and included, so we're not going to charge you extra for it. It's going to be relatively simple to deploy and integrate, as Doc alluded to earlier, with server cluster software and the key components that people would use there in terms of databases and in terms of operating systems. And it's fundamentally going to be able to offer not just that zero RPO at zero RTO active active environment, but if you do and when you do need to go to a third site at distance for the true disaster recovery, if you ever lost your metropolitan area, we're gonna be able to do it at an RPO that is lower than anything else in the market. Doc, are there complexities associated with doing this at petabyte scale? I mean, you guys make a big deal out of that. You're clearly excited about it, but is it, is it extra hard to do at that kind of volume at scale? Uh, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you give you two answers. I'm going to say yes, it's incredibly <laughs> difficult to do. Uh, but then I'm going to say it's incredibly easy for the customer to do because we've made it easy. You know, you have, there are a lot of ramifications to doing things at, at petabyte scale. There's the, the size of the, the caching cables that you have to worry about. There's the numbers of things that need to be checked and counter-checked and constantly cross-checked for, for validity. There's also the scale of things that, that happen, like silent data corruption that need to, be, need to be factored in. All of those things are being done by Infinibox uh, on, on a constant basis with no impact to the customer, no impact to the administrator, no impact to the running application. And I think that's, a, frankly, another differentiator as well. You know, we used to, Ken and I have, have some common history as well, <laughs> we used to, constantly talk about internally, you know, what happens as, as things get larger, systems slow down, that just sim simply doesn't happen with Infinibox. And that's why uh, service providers use us as well. Cloud service providers, managed service providers are some of our biggest customers. 
because they know they can have uh, have these large scale systems running with all these different workloads, all these different functions, you know, be they snapshots, clones, whatever they are, with no impact and very easy and rapid to deploy. Yeah, I said up top, you, you got to be storage hardos to make this stuff work. <laughs> it's very complicated and we've seen it for years and years. Last question. Um, again, huge changes in the last 150 days uh, where, where people are just really tuned in to things like digital transformation. I talked about security, uh, business resiliency, business continuity. Where, let me start with you, Ken. What, how should users be thinking about this? What, what steps should they be taking like now? Well, a great question. And, and back to sort of where we started. Um, because of the nature of how things have changed, more applications are mission critical than they've ever been before. And providing an always on infrastructure to make sure that you can give your users and your customers and your business the opportunity to stay alive in the face of just about anything that could happen has never been more important in the history of this industry. Doc, I'll give you the final word. You can pile on that. You know, I think Ken summed it up really well, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to take a different different twist on it. It's all about de-risking, and you know, a lot of the CIOs and CTOs of companies that I've been talking to over the course of the past couple of months have basically said, "Hey, my my digital transformation initiatives are on hold right now because I've got to keep the lights on. I've got to keep my business running. Uh, in some cases, maybe I've had to sadly tear down my staff." Um, but I've got remote workers I've got to worry about. So, you know, find, find a partner that's going to de-risk your, your infrastructure for you. Take a look at some of the things that we've announced in the, in the past few months as well. You know, we'll take a lot of that risk away, not only from the availability perspective, but we're going to take the risk away from a cost perspective. You know, if you want to, if you want to talk about Infinidat, don't worry about things like, how am I going to migrate over to it? We're going to do that for you. We're going to work with you. We're going to come up with a plan. We're going to make as much of it non-disruptive as we can. And we're going to assume the cost of doing it. We're going to take away all the risk of availability. We just talked about all of that. We're going to give you guarantees about 100% availability. We'll help you architect the right solution for you. And we'll protect you moving forward. You might need some, some uh, flex area of, of capacity uh, as you work through some of these new applications and new initiatives you got to do, wouldn't it take the risk away with our elastic pricing models? Use the storage for when you need it, return it when you don't, and you don't have to pay for it anymore. We'll make it that simple for you. We'll give you that you know, cloud operating paradigm on premises. And by the way, no egress costs. <laughs> well, this is a hard problem for people because they've had to do the work from home pivot, I, IT people specifically, I mean, They've had to spend to shore up that infrastructure. And of course, organizations are saying, well, we're going to pull from other places. But look, if you're not digital today, you're, you're not being able to transact business. And so you can't relax your business continuity plans. In fact, you have to evolve them. Guys, thanks very much for sharing your perspectives and insights on this whole notion of de-risking infrastructure with, with business continuity. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Dave. Dave, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. And thank you, everybody, for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, and we'll see you next time.